Good evening. It is 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, and this regular meeting of the Sandpoint Planning and Zoning Commission is now called to order. For the record, I'm Chairman Jason Welker, presiding in Council Chambers at Sandpoint City Hall, 1123 West Lake Street in Sandpoint, Idaho. Also present are Commissioners John Hastings, Kate Huisman, Forrest Shuck, and Mo Dunkel. Commissioners Tom Riggs and Slade Camp are absent. First, we'll start with announcements. Are there any general announcements or reports from commissioners or from staff? a question. Please speak into your microphone, Kate. Um, I'm wondering if anyone in this room can give me an update on our search for a city planner. I haven't heard anything on that in a while. I don't see either Amanda or Jennifer here. Is anyone else here know how that search is going? I think we would need Jennifer or Amanda to give that update and they are at a meeting tonight, a different meeting. All right, I'll ask next meeting. Thank you, Fonda. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Kate. Um, next on the agenda is meeting minutes approval. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the September 21st, 2021 meeting. I move to approve the minutes as written. Kate. Second. Second, John. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes and the minutes are approved. Uh, there is no old business on the agenda this evening, so we'll move on to new business. I'm gonna raise my seat first. I feel like I'm really low. <laughs> Weird one. It's not it's unusual that I feel short. There we go. Okay, the final item on the agenda this evening is a public hearing on a request from Lighthouse Incorporated for a comprehensive land use plan amendment. Sorry, land use map amendment from industrial to context area three and a zone change from industrial general to residential multifamily to facilitate the subsequent development of multifamily housing on the site, which is not part of this request, but will be subject to a future application. The site is located at the southeast corner of Great Northern and Woodland Drive, parcel RPS 00000103650A. This public hearing was originally scheduled for September 21st and was subsequently rescheduled to this evening. A notice of public hearing was published in the Bonner County Daily Bee on August 31st, 2021. The order and procedure for the public hearing will be as follows. First, we'll have an explanation of the subject of the public hearing by city staff. Then we'll have a presentation by the applicant. Please note the commissioners should address their questions to the applicant at this time. Next, we'll, have, uh, we'll open the public hearing, at which time the public may provide testimony. Questions should be asked of those testifying at that time. The order for those providing testimony will be as follows. A, in favor, B, neutral, and C, opposed. Next, we'll have the applicant's rebuttal testimony, at which time final questions may be asked of the applicant. Please note that if new facts are elicited during rebuttal, the public will be given an opportunity to comment on any new facts. Next, we'll close the public hearing. And finally, the commissioners will debate or deliberate, excuse me. No new information may be provided after the hearing has been closed with questions directed only to city staff during deliberation. Before I proceed any further, I would like to ask for confirmation from each commissioner, please, that you have had no ex parte contact or conflict of interest as pertains to this request. None. Of course, Kate? None. None for me. John? None for me. No? None. Okay. I will now yield the floor to interim city planner, Darren Fluke, for his introduction of this request and explanation of these applications. Darren? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, can you all hear me okay? We sure yeah. can. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and you'll let me know if there's an issue with that. And go to presentation mode. Are you seeing that okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, good, good introduction, Mr. Chairman. Tonight you're here to hear DZC 21001, which is a proposed amendment to the comprehensive future land use map and a subsequent or attendant zone change along with that application. <clears throat> Um, it's important for us to recognize um, the order in which you'll be hearing these items this evening. The comprehensive plan map amendment must come first. It is a request, as you stated, to redesignate a 25 acre parcel from industrial to CA3, that's context area three, which is a um, higher density mixed use designation within the uh, Sandpoint comprehensive plan. If and only if the, the commission agrees that the comprehensive plan use map amendment is uh, um, 
appropriate and approves that request, then they should uh, consider the zone change request. If the map amendment is not approved, then there really is no reason to hear the zone change request because it would not be in accordance with the comprehensive plan and therefore not approvable. So we'll hear first the uh, comprehensive plan amendment and then we will consider the zone change request. Any questions uh, regarding that so far? Okay. Doesn't look like it. So as the chairman stated, the site is located here at the southeastern corner of Woodland Drive and Mountain View Drive, just to the west um, of the Sandpoint Airport. The comprehensive plan designates the site as industrial, as you can see here on this map. The request is, is to go to context area three, which is a designation within the, um, the comprehensive plan. Um, for a higher density mixed use residential type zone. You can see here that um, how the city is uh, laid out within the comprehensive plan, generally going from more intensity within the core um, to a lesser intensity as you uh, move to the margins of the city. And then you see the, the rural areas that are within the city area of impact, not currently within the city limits. Presumably those, um, you know, may change as the city limits expand, um, but in the interim, the city is uh, intending for those areas to develop uh, at very low densities um, until they, you know, get annexed into the city. So um, by way of an introduction or, or explanation, the comprehensive plan has very little to say about industrial land. Um, I did a, a search through the plan um, for the word industrial and literally there's uh, no more than about a dozen instances of, of the term within the plan. Um, and this is pretty much by way of context, the most that it has to say about industrial is that those areas that were existing as industrial um, were by and large designated as industrial um, when this plan was adopted. Um, with the CA3 zone, again, those development patterns are um, an increase in density of housing, um, smaller lot sizes, smaller setbacks, uh, and as well as options for shared open space and the inclusion of attached and detached multifamily units. So much more of a traditional mixed use zone. So I'm going to go into a quick analysis. An analysis may be um, an overstatement here. I want to point out for the commission that what you're considering this evening is, is really a request for a change to the adopted vision of the community. And you're considering um, two very distinct public benefits. That is the need for industrial land um, versus the need for residential land. Both of those things are public goods. The community went through a very um, you know, rigorous process in developing and adopting the comprehensive plan and the map um, and vision that was included within that. And so as such, the, the presumption um, is that we have the correct zoning designation currently and we should stick with that. Therefore, the burden of proof does lie with the applicant um, in, in convincing the commission that this is the right course of action to take this land out of industrial and move it into the uh, more residential type section. The analysis that we're going to provide you this evening is, shouldn't be considered as a preference of the staff or trying to lead the commission, merely um, providing facts and conditions on the ground so that you can make an informed decision based on um, the rest of the testimony and evidence that you'll hear this in this evening's hearing. So um, as you consider first the comprehensive plan amendment, the, the proper questions in front of the commission, and or another way of saying that, the affirmative findings that the commission must, must make is that there is a need for additional residential land within the city, that um, there is um, less of a need for industrial land, although we know that need exists. We just don't know exactly what that is or what time frame that exists on. Um, you're looking also at land use compatibility. And importantly here, you want to consider the existing land uses in proximity to the uh, proposed zone change um, comp plan amendment, um, as well as future land uses. And of course, compatibility with the operation of the Sandpoint Airport, which is an economic engine for your community. 
And then finally, um, the commission should consider if in taking this action, they would be establishing a precedent that future or um, current owners of industrial land might wish to avail themselves of um, for future applications. Um, this would be a natural point for me to just pause and ask if the commission had any questions before I um, dive into um, just a, a brief analysis of each one of these bullet points. Any questions? Nope, doesn't sound like it, Darren. Okay, hearing none. Um, so first of all, um, with regard to the demand for um, residential land within the city, um, it's notoriously difficult to um, sit back as staff and sort of prognosticate what the future needs are for every category of land use, especially in a, a community the size of Sandpoint, which um, doesn't have an unlimited land base um, and is fairly well constrained by, by the conditions on the ground. Um, we do know, however, that the market does seem to be responding to the demand for residential development. Um, these numbers should be somewhat familiar to the Commission, both because they were in the staff report and uh, these mirror the numbers that were provided a month or two ago um, at an update that was given by staff to the Commission just on the amount of uh, development activity that's happening. Um, currently, we see that there's um, 600 units, basically 599 to be exact, within the development pipeline. 171 of those are under um, building permit review or in construction. And then we know that we have at least 428 units that are being proposed somewhere within the entitlement process. These numbers are just a tad bit dated. I understand that they got updated just before we went to uh, press with the staff report. And so those uh, numbers in the left column are slightly higher. For our purposes, however, I think this gives you a big enough uh, picture of what's happening within the city um, to, to use as a data point as you evaluate this request. Essentially, the 600 units that you see here in the pipeline um, would represent about 15% of the total housing stock that exists in the city now, which is just over uh, 4,000 dwelling units based on uh, the 2020 census number. Um, it's also important for me to, to recognize that those units within um, entitlement are not necessarily assured. Those are projects that people have applied for, um, but may or may not get built, you know, depending on um, conditions going forward. So this slide is really just meant to speak to um, what we have in the pipeline right now as far as uh, residential product that will be coming online within the next year or two. Um, with regard to land designated um, for various land uses within the city, you can see on the pie chart on the right that we have approximately 452 acres that have been designated as industrial land which represents around 21% of the total land area within the city. You can see the other land uses there. Um, context area two, which is primarily single family residential, uh, um, represents the largest percentage at about 28% of the land area. Context area three, which is what you're considering this evening for this property, represents about 20% of the designated land area with the other um, um, land context area is coming in slightly less than that. I would note for you that all of those um, context areas 3, 3B, um, 4, and 5 all allow for multifamily development. Um, it is very difficult for us therefore to um, tell you what um, available land there is for multifamily residential. We do know that uh, the percentage of vacant RM zoned land is approximately 6% um, of, of that zoned land, but there's much more availability than that just because uh, the other zoning designations allow for it. It's just difficult for us to predict, uh, you know, what the mix of land uses will be in those zones that allow for uh, more of a mix of land uses. The map on the left is just meant to show you really how, how the um, comprehensive planned land use designations um, lay out within the city. It's notable that um, the industrial designations are uh, quite tidy <laughs> for a city um, and are pretty much clustered around the airport and are not allowed anywhere else within the city. And that we think is an important with regard to industrial general in specific, 
So um, the 420 acres that you see there on the pie chart on the left does represent the zoning of industrial general within the city, something less than 20% uh, of the land area. Um, that 420 acres breaks down as you see on the right hand pie chart, which is approximately 143 acres of that land is already developed with uh, land use going concerns. 168 acres of those 420 acres um, account for the airport itself and those associated land uses um, adjoining the airport directly with the remaining 100 or so acres um, undeveloped. And so the 25% um, uh, application or the 25 acres that you see tonight represents about 23% of the remaining vacant industrial land within the city of San Francisco. With regard to the airport, I really just love this uh, oblique aerial view here on the left. There's no other reason to have it than it's just good eye candy for you to show the, uh, the airport there and the adjoining land uses. Um, the map on the right, however, is important. And it, what it shows you are the runway protection zones um, in relative to the property as well as the industrial zoning. And so the gray areas there represent industrial zoning. That purple is also an industrial zoning designation, although not the industrial um, general designation that we're speaking of tonight. You'll see that the property in question, which is up here um, just to the um, west of the airport, um, lies adjacent to, but not within the runway protection zone here. Um, as such, the land uses are not restricted on this property, um, although it does lie within um, a horizontal protection zone, which would limit the height of, of future land uses or future buildings within that. And our, our analysis of that didn't show that that would be a particular constraint to the property. We did receive a late email from Dave Shuck, the director of the airport, um, stating that they don't necessarily um, support the rezone request as um, they're looking to protect the operation of the airport from incompatible Land uses. Darren, I had a quick question for you. Okay. Um, the lateral safety zone, uh, I was a little confused by page 15 of your staff report, which shows the red line, but also a green zone that extends quite a bit further into the 25 acres. What is that green zone that on page 15 of your staff report? Um, yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry that was confusing. Um, I, I'll, uh, in full disclosure, I spent about an hour <laughs> in, the, uh, in the airport section of the zoning ordinance trying to puzzle through this. And so um, I can try to share my screen so we can all look at the same thing. I need to um, stop and see if I can bring that up really quickly for you. I hope this is not beyond my uh, technical capabilities here. So, Mr. Chairman, are you seeing the, yeah. the figure that you were referring to? Or are you still seeing Yeah, the... exactly. I was a little confused about what the green shaded area represents. Right, so that, that is the transitional zone within the red line that you see here. That is the runway protection zone and um, land uses are strictly um, regulated within between these two lines. And basically the code says you shall not um, rezone lands to higher residential densities or allow incompatible land uses within that zone. The horizontal zone um, by contrast and, and even the transitional zone, the green that is outside of this area here. By the way, this triangle represents about um, 120,000 square feet. So that would be, you know, roughly three acres or so in the property um, is an area where they um, where the code limits the height of buildings, um, but does not regulate the land uses that are allowed within that zone. And so essentially, those are, um, it's just a zone that is meant to uh, not um, obscure the operation of the airport with uh, buildings or any any structures for that matter that are of a particular height. 
And if I'm remembering co correctly from uh, the definition in the code, it says that for um, every um, seven feet that you go away from this line here, you're allowed a foot of height, which um, would allow us almost 100 feet of height here, which is far in excess of what the zone would allow anyway. So that's why we um, mentioned that it was really not a constraint. Okay, thanks for that clarification. <laughs> Was that a clarification or was that just, did that oh, just I, the... <laughs> it, it was when I first looked at that page, I thought that the green indicated the lateral safety zone. Um, I wasn't, yeah, but now I understand that that's outside the lateral safety zone, but there might be height restrictions the closer you get to the lateral safety zone line. Yep, well said. And this slide just provides you a tad bit more context um, with regard to the airport and the surrounding area. So you can see that those zones are, are quite large. Um, and you can see the property here as well outlined. So I'm going to stop that and go back to the other slide. So um, this would be, I believe, an appropriate um, spot for the commission to um, pause and discuss the um, not discuss necessarily, but ask any questions of staff that you might have um, regarding the, the conditions that we just talked about. Um, from here, I was going to move into a discussion of the zone change, which again, um, is only pertinent if the commission finds um, positively that this is the appropriate uh, change to the land use designation. Uh Darren, are you going to come to this comparable numbers for residentially zoned land or context that um, we have left for infill development in the city? So we can compare the, what we'd gain here for residential development versus what we already have. Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner, thanks for that question. And we did anticipate that. Um, it's difficult for us to tease a, a very accurate number out of the GIS data. What I should have mentioned for you at the outset was that um, these are all um, fairly high level numbers. They're meant to give you an order of magnitude idea of what we're dealing with um, in the city, but they're not in any way meant to be exact or, or represent exact conditions on the ground um, because things do change relatively quickly and certain properties become, you know, perhaps dilapidated and, and therefore um, eligible for redevelopment. It's, it's very difficult for us to give you a number. What I can tell you, um, an exact number that would make you feel, you know, um, secure in what you're doing. What I can tell you is that this pie chart on the left represents the zoning designations that are allowed for in the city. The 444 acres there of the RM zone, um, we know that about 6% of that is um, vacant and therefore eligible as is for development with multifamily. Um, but we also know that a number of those properties um, of the some amount of the land within that 444 acres is, is eligible for redevelopment and, and perhaps even ripe for redevelopment. Um, based on the conditions on the ground. We just don't know what the exact number is. Similarly, we um, have the 183 acres of the context area A here. Um, I'm sorry, this is um, commercial area A and commercial area B within this 183 acres. It does allow for uh, multifamily within both of those zones, as does the commercial C zoning designation here. Um, it's just very difficult for me to give you um, an apples to apples number on you know, what's available. What was that figure, I'm sorry, Darren, that you first, you gave a percentage of land in RM zone that is? 6% vacant. 6% of vacant. About 27 acres vacant. Okay. All right, thank you. And, Commissioner or, or Mr. Chairman and Commissioner, of course, that, that represents only land that is zoned RM. It does not represent land that is zoned multifamily, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mixed use residential, such as what you have um, next to the um, Super One to the east. 
that is undeveloped um, and you know other properties within the commercial zoning designations that would allow for multifamily, um, but would also allow for a range of other uses. Thank you. Darren? Yes. Forest here. Of the uh, 84 acres, remaining vacant, can you say how much of that is parcels of two and a half acres or larger? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, I'm afraid I don't have that number um, available. I could, um, I could bring up the GIS map and we could look at the parcel um, layer, but um, I, it would just be a wild guess on my part. I wouldn't be able to give you anything accurate on that. Or can I ask what the significance of two and a half acres is? If somebody wanted to build a 50,000 square foot warehouse, for instance, or a distribution center, they're going to need a certain amount of acreage to accommodate drainage, um, impervious surface, parking, and so mm -hmm. forth. Those questions are out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, the difference being if you have a two and a half acre, three acres, six acre parcel here and there, uh, such development is probably worth someone to consider. But if it's 32 acre and less parcels in small industrial areas and a spot here and a spot there, like, I don't know, Baldy Park Drive sort of thing, um, it's not going to be suitable for that type of development. And that type of development's out there and waiting. So mm -hmm. that's one of my concerns. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Darren at this time? Okay, Darren, I think you can carry on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With regard to the zone change, um, just a similar slide here, giving you the, the land use context with uh, in the city. Um, this does indicate, I see my arrows moved on me here, but this is meant to be up here from Industrial General on this site right here. Um, to um, residential multifamily, which is the blue designation. So you can see the amount of uh, residential multifamily um, or at least it's uh, generalized location within the city um, on, depicted on this map relative as well to the, uh, the runway protection zones there. So um, with regard to those, uh, the purpose statements for those zones, um, you can see here that the industrial general districts intended for lands uh, that have light and medium manufacturing and industrial activities with the direct access to the major transportation routes. Um, importantly, arterial roads, air and rail service included within that. This is your uh, basic um, industrial zoning designation within the city. It does allow for the broadest range of industrial land uses within the city um, and does um, you know, as a fairly limited resource within in the city. Um, the residential multifamily, by contrast, is areas um, are intended to preserve lands for housing and to provide diversity in housing options. And so, of course, it's um, correlated with the context area three zoning designation on the comprehensive plan map. One of the considerations um, for making a, a affirmative finding for rezoning property is the efficient delivery of services. Um, and this includes sewer and water, um, police and fire protection, parks, libraries, you know, all those things that a city provides. Um, and you should note that uh, this application was transmitted to the, the service providers um, and that development on this particular property um, is, um, we, it can be accommodated with regard to those essential services, whether it in, um, develops with industrial land uses or with residential land uses. However, as with uh, any site within the city, um, specific applications may require specific improvements to specific systems, and those will be evaluated at the time of application. And so if this property were to be redesignated as um, um, CA, um, three within the comprehensive plan and therefore rezoned to the RM zoning designation, it would be subject to a conditional use application um, for development of a multifamily project. 
And at that time, we'd evaluate the, the road system as well as the, the basic utility systems to see uh, um, what would need to be improved to accommodate the development. So um, the, the Sandpoint uh, or, uh, Zoning Ordinance does allow for a development agreement in conjunction with a zone change request. I mean, as you can see here, the purpose of a development agreement is a discretionary tool to be used by the commission and the council and or the council, I would say, um, that will allow a change in zoning for a specific project with a specific use to be developed on a property in an area which may not be appropriate for all uses permitted outright or conditionally within the proposed zone. Um, in this, I tried to point out in the staff report for you um, would include the full range of land uses that are allowed within the RM zoning designation that the commission may or may not find to be appropriate on this um, property. Um, procedurally, we think that it would be appropriate if the commission um, finds makes affirmative findings on the comprehensive plan amendment um, and therefore um, considers the zone change and makes a recommendation on the zone change to the council. Um, it would be appropriate for you to consider whether or not that zone change um, should be subject to the provisions of a development agreement. And if you go that route, um, you should consider if um, you would recommend that the council um, consider requiring a development agreement that um, requires a particular land use on the property. And if that land use doesn't happen within a particular amount of time, that the zoning would then automatically revert back to the original industrial designation. I have a couple more slides on this, but I don't wanna belabor this point. I think it could be more productive um, if the commission had questions regarding development agreements, um, I'd be happy to entertain those. Are there any questions regarding development agreements? I, I do we are are we in a position here this evening, Darren, to try to provide language for that to send to council or an outline of what we're looking for? Can we put conditions on the property that it only be used for certain types of housing? What are what are kind of boundaries there? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that um, is a good question. And the answer is that you are being asked to um, redesignate property from industrial to multifamily. The specific stated purpose within the application was um, to create workforce housing on the property. Um, if that is um, persuasive to the commission, um, the applicant should not be objectionable then to entering into an agreement to, um, you know, produce that sort of product on this property and exclude other things that would be allowed within the zone. Um, you know, there's a whole host of land uses, which I um, tried to highlight in the staff report that, that are allowed with RM. Um, our preference this evening is that if the commission goes this route that you recommend that the council um, negotiate a development agreement with the owners of the property with certain sideboards. And so we would expect you to provide your um, high level um, recommendation to the council regarding what the future land use is and perhaps the uh, um, time frame for, uh, for achieving that land use and then um, a uh, consequence, in this case, revision back to the original zoning designation um, if the applicants fail to perform. Darren, Does that you help, or did you have other considerations that you wanted? Um, I'm still working on. Uh, I'm just wondering what language will be sufficient. I remember at some meeting in these chambers within the last month or two, someone had the question, "Who's workforce?" and how do we define that term? Uh, if that's the term we give to council, uh, and I. Don't know if you have an answer to that or whether maybe Jason's question will throw some well, further light on the issue. That that was my question. And, and we're going to hear from Mr. Grimm here in a moment, but he defines workforce housing in his presentation um, as that with the, which is which which is within reach for people earning 
percent, certain percentages of the area median income. So um, a, a development agreement that requires multifamily housing, you know, a higher density, the highest density allowed or whatever it may be on this, on this zone um, may not, that we, we, we've seen actually in Ponderé and, and elsewhere in Sandpoint multifamily housing that is very much market priced housing, which will not necessarily be affordable for people in our workforce. So I'm wondering uh, to what extent can we define workforce housing in a development agreement as it's defined by various agencies and, and other groups that work in this area, uh, such as um, housing that's only available to people who are employed in the local workforce or, or people who actually live in the area, not seasonal people who might want to buy these units to rent them out at a market rate. Um, to what extent can we define workforce housing in a way that we believe is beneficial for the uh, needs of our community? And I would also add the needs of the several employers who wrote letters of support for this project. We heard from the CEOs of Bonner General Health, the superintendent of the school district, the CEO of Lighthouse, all in favor of this and all emphasizing the need for housing for people who work in the local economy. So Darren, how, how strict can we be in a development agreement in terms of assuring that this housing will be developed primarily for people who work in the local economy? and not market priced. So we, we need to define whose workforce is, is what I'm saying. And if I may, Darren, this sure. is Fonda. Mr. Chairman, I think it would be, I think you were correct in your initial statement. I think it would be appropriate at this point. Let's move forward with the applicant's presentation and the public hearing. And you can circle back to all of these questions for staff in deliberations. Okay. Darren, would you like to come back to this later then? Mr. Chair, um, I would. I would only like to say at this point that if you um, will go to page 13 of your staff report, um, about the middle of the page, the last paragraph there right before the number two, we do define workforce housing for you is generally defined as affordable to households earning between 60 and 120% of the AMI, um, which for a household of 2.14, I think, in Sandpoint is 52,000. So. Um, that um, we can revisit this later. I think what we're envisioning here was that um, the commission would give the council a recommendation for some fairly high level sideboards as to what that development agreement would um, include. And that after the council acts, that development agreement would come back in front of the city, uh, in front of the planning and zoning commission for a recommendation before going back to the city council. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Darren before we start the public hearing? Mr. Chairman, before you start the public hearing, I just, I have uh, the slide up on the public hearing procedure. You're all well familiar with that. Um, tonight, you do have um, three choices in front of you according to the same point code. You could recommend uh, the council approve or deny the comp plan amendment. Um, and then accordingly, you could recommend that the council approve or deny the zone change request. Again, if you do not recommend approval of the comprehensive plan amendment, there is no point in recommending approval of the, the zone change request because you can't make affirmative findings for that. Um, and then finally, you could postpone the application. Um, I also have within your staff report the findings um, that you should make if you want to approve the land use map amendment. They're listed here. And uh, right below that in the staff report are listed the uh, findings of fact for the zone change, and those are listed there. So perhaps I'll leave these here for now and um, we can open the hearing and let me know if you have questions. Thanks, Darren. All right, we will now prepare to proceed with the public hearing. For the record, all written comments received in time have been included in the meeting packet and provided to the commissioners. Please note that the public hearing is for comments only. Do not address any questions to the commissioners or to city staff. If commissioners have questions for the person testifying, they should ask those questions at the time of their testimony. For those in attendance here in chambers this evening, I'm sorry, are we supposed to have a uh, presentation from the applicant first before we do the public hearing? Public hearing before the applicant. Okay. Okay, for those in attendance here in chambers this evening, if you would like to speak, you will need to complete a sign-up form. You can do that now. Um, available on the table by the door and handed to the clerk. Please state on your form whether you wish to speak in favor or neutral or are in opposition to this request. Do not approach the dais. If you have any written materials for the commissioners, please hand those to the clerk. For those participating on Zoom, please the note, note that you will need a working microphone on your phone or computer to speak. When your name is called, you will see a prompt on your screen asking you whether you would like to unmute. Uh, then you will need to unmute yourself in order to be heard. The clerk will now lower all hands on Zoom. 
in order in order to take testimony in order the order previously stated. Um, so if uh, before we begin the public hearing, we're actually going to hear from our applicant first. So we'll hand it over to Mr. Grimm, and then we'll open up uh, the public hearing in order of in favor, neutral, and opposed. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. before Mr. Grimm starts, I also need to advise the commission. You may be aware that there was an article regarding this application in the Sandpoint Reader last week. I need to just remind you that your job this evening is to make a decision based on the evidence before you. I am going to anticipate that all of the information in that article is also going to be presented, but that you can only make your decision this evening based on the evidence that you have presented tonight. Thank you. Mr. Grimm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Planning Commission members, uh, interim planning director and city staff. Thanks for having us today. I'm Jeremy Grimm, owner of Whiskey Rock Planning. Um, and I'm here to uh, assist uh, Lighthouse uh, in the rezone and comp plan change of this property from um, uh, industrial to CA3 and a zone change from industrial general to residential multifamily. Just a couple of quick clarifications from the presentation there before I get going. Um, uh, Darren had mentioned a couple of times that this potential zone change would allow mixed use development. Um, the residential multifamily doesn't allow commercial uh, use, usage. So this is a residential zone change. And um, I'm not, I just read through my narrative uh, two times. I, I don't believe I use the word workforce housing. I, I talk about multifamily housing and housing for our workers. Um, if I'm wrong on that, um, please let me know. I may have where. confused the staff report in your report. I apologize. No, so. no problem. No problem. So uh, as I mentioned, Jeremy Grimm um, recently uh, appointed to Region 1, um, uh, the Governor's Economic Advisory Council, representing the five northern counties on economic development and uh, business interest in the state. Um, with that, I just want to tell you, first, I'm going to walk through sort of the comp plan, then some housing supply and demand uh, numbers to show you uh, some of these points that Darren uh, brought up that are important, the need for this change. Um, gonna walk through the industrial land capacity and some employment figures, and finally talk about traffic and some other outlying uh, elements of the request. Uh, to start with the comprehensive plan, uh, on the my right side of the screen, I don't know, what you guys are looking at, but uh, some of the verbiage in the comp plan really emphasizes this, this desire to limit the urban sprawl. And it talks about uh, preserving the area of city impact by focusing development in the existing city limits. It talks about uh, minimizing um, urban intrusion, incursion into the ACI. Um, and it's all part of this comprehensive growth strategy. It talks about containment of sprawl and promoting infill development. Um, under the goals, LU1, it talks about reducing pressure to expand into the area of city impact. And under the housing variety, um, policy B talks about encouraging low to moderate income housing with development incentives like density bonus bonuses or other similar strategies. And I would argue your uh, understanding of what's at stake tonight would be some of those other similar strategies. And when I say what's at stake, um, we are in a absolute critical crisis with housing in this community. You know, jumping to the staff report, um, Darren points out Idaho Code 676508 that talks about your roles and uh, responsibilities as a commission to conduct the planning process. But also in that same statute, it talks about a review and update of the comprehensive plan. And I'll note that that hasn't been done since uh, 2009 fully. There were some spotty little, um, I guess I'll call them duct tape changes to it. But further in 676507, it's quite clear that the commission may at any time make recommendations and changes to the comp plan. So um, you do have the statutory authority to um, make this change, even though it's not part of a larger comprehensive uh, plan uh, adoption or revision. In the staff report, uh, Darren mentions that comprehensive plan amendments are relatively rare because of the general rule jurisdictions don't favor modifying the long range vision for the community. I would point out that in the comprehensive plan, the one that's currently uh, adopted, uh, in terms of the action items and implementation, revision of the comprehensive plan was supposed to occur in 2014. So to politely say that the comprehensive plan is stale and totally 
unaligned, misaligned with the dynamic changes that are going on in this community right now um, is, is to be mild. Um, so the existing comp plan was adopted in 2009 with 23 special meetings of the council. And frankly, a lot's changed in 14 years, but certainly not our affordability challenge. Uh, looking at the staff report, uh, I just want to just briefly touch on this whole section about the airport to lateral hazard zones and overlay and the comments from the airport uh, director, Mr. Shuck. Um, per the staff report, the property in question does not fall under the jurisdiction of this component of the plan. So uh, I'd like to just leave it there because um, it's either in or out and it's certainly out. Um, if you really were interested though, and you look at the one amendment, update to the comp plan in 2019. It does talk about the airport facilities and it does talk about um, one of the implementation action plans, which is to change the design guidelines to include elements such as clustered housing and building placement. But again, it's out. So I'd rather not go any more about that. In terms of housing demand and capacity in, in the community, um, you know, uh, staff report says the market seems to be responding to the lack of supply, and I, I generally agree, um, free markets are an amazing thing. Um, but I do take some umbrage to sort of some of these numbers here. First of all, um, my clients that I represent right now at Whiskey Rock probably uh, are involved in three quarters uh, of, of the numbers that you see up there. And I can tell you um, from my internal knowledge of what's in the pipeline, um, many of these projects and uh, the actual vertical build of these buildings are years away. So it seems like a big number, but in fact, um, there's a little more um, detail when you look at the numbers and what's been going on in Sandpoint. First, I wanna flip back to the comp plan here. And in the comp plan, we talk about um, the projected growth in the community from 2006 and onward. And the council was very thoughtful and they know that there's peaks and booms and valleys and they chose a low growth rate of about 2.5% annually. In the center there, Sandpoint population forecast, you'll see if we had grown at 2.5%, which we have not done, we would be um, north of 10,767 residents at this point. I bring this up because based on the 2020 census, uh, and the 4,028 dwelling units that are estimated to be in, in the community, that 2.5% growth rate would amount to about 100 new dwelling units a year, okay? Um, anything short of that, um, the, the chairman will appreciate uh, supply and demand will, will uh, impact pricing. I, um, I've, I've had some concerns with the numbers that have been floated out there. So I went back through all the building permit data in the city of Sandpoint for the last four years. Um, year to date, new single family building permits, 26 in Sandpoint, okay? These are structures that are actually plywood going up, people can possibly live in in the next, call it four months, okay? Um, if you go back further, uh, 2020, there were 41, 2019, there were 63. So a total of 130 single family units have been constructed in some standpoint in the last three years. Okay, if you, if you look at that comp plan 2.5% growth, the 4,028 units, 100 dwelling units a year, you know, the low growth proje projection is 300 dwelling units we should have had in the last three years, um, when actually we've actually only built 130. Um, now there's multifamily dwelling units that are included like up uh, by the fairgrounds, uh, Whitewater Creek, but many of those units are age or income restricted. And if you're not aware of what that means, it means that in some circumstances, if you get a raise at your job, you actually can't take that raise or you'll lose your housing availability. And I know specifically of people that's happened to, and they've said, I can't take the bonus or the raise. So when we're talking about market rate housing and worker housing, um, just keep that in mind that some of these units that are going online are probably not targeted towards our workers that we need in our, in our industries and our businesses. So you look at the supply and the demand and we have a deficit of um, 28 units at least in the last uh, three years. And this next slide really shows you what that deficit does to pricing. This is a from um, the Census Bureau, um, the 2019 uh, community survey. 
47% of our renters are paying more than 30% of their income for housing costs. And 30%, 37% of our homeowners are paying above 30%, which is generally considered the maximum affordability. Anything more than that, you're house burdened. And, and I, I can't say more to that. The numbers speak for itself. I think the city can probably understand trying to replace staff um, in the housing climate we have. This is a, a critical, critical issue right now for this community. And I'd say it's the most critical issue um, that we face because we will lose our employers, we will lose our businesses, and we will lose a lot. And we will become Jackson Hole if we lose those employers and businesses. Um, talking about the sort of land capacity, the first one issue I wanna bring up here about the industrial land is, um, the staff report talks about 168 acres uh, of being airport owned. And, you know, this is 23% of the remaining vacant land. Um, the first point I want to make here is when you look at the Bonner County parcel ownership of the airport, um, it's, it's not 168 acres, okay? It's um, uh, less than that. It's, a, it's 122 acres. Now, it's just a few numbers, but it's, it's, that's another 48, 40 plus acres. Um, but when you look at the overall ability to do infill and develop industrial land, um, this 25 acres represents about 6% of our industrial general lands. And I go into a little more detail showing you this. Um, you know, maybe it's semantics, but here's an example of the Cox property on the west side of the airport. Um, it's clearly 10 acres. You can clearly put some more industrial development in there or subdivide the property. So is it vacant? No, is it developable? Absolutely. Um, another example is uh, this one on the east side of the airport um, near uh, off, off a of mountain view. Um, again, you know, nine acres. Um, There's some buildings and structures on it, but could it be infilled and developed? Absolutely. So when you look at um, an analysis of what kind of jobs does it take, uh, or what's the absorption of jobs in an industrial facility? I wanted to show you what that looks like so you can understand that we have plenty of land to absorb industrial and manufacturing job growth in Sandpoint for over 100 years. Uh, the first one, this is Leadlock Biomedical, at least it was. Um, this um, property is roughly um, you know, a third of an acre. There's 62 full-time employees there. Uh, it comes out to a density of about you know, 204 employees per acre uh, for medical product manufacturing. Um, this is uh, Quest, formerly Quest, De Hare, um, 260 full-time employees on 2.6 acres, about 100 employees per acre. <coughs> um, Lighthouse is another one here. 266 full-time employees on two acres, about 133 employees per acre. And where I'm going with all of this is if you look at the average number of employees per acre on our industrial uh, developed land, you get about 146 uh, employees per um, acre. And if you look at the fact, these green parcels that I've highlighted here, to uh, Commissioner uh, Shuck's point, there are a couple smaller ones, and I fully agree that those can't be developed with warehousing, but many of these are relatively large uh, acreage parcels. In total, it's over 137 acres. Um, if, you, if you do the math on this, it's, it's like 125 years worth of industrial employment growth on these properties. So I just wanna bring up the point that we have plenty of industrial lands and not to get too far in the weeds, I just wanna give you a couple other quick data points here. This is um, projected industrial employment in the region. Uh, this is for North Idaho, provided by the Idaho Department of Labor through 2030. This just came out this year. This is for the five Northern counties. And you'll see manufacturing there. If, if we were to absorb all the manufacturing jobs in the next 10 years they project, there's gonna be 1,590 90 jobs in manufacturing, right? So 159 a year. Um, that's all of Northern Idaho. Uh, I just want to put that in contrast to the 28,000 or 2,843 jobs a year that we have to supply housing for, for all the other industries and all the other businesses and services that our economy depends on. So I, I appreciate um, quite well the, the concern about eroding the industrial base uh, in, our, in our community. But I think we also have to be quite aware that um, there are a lot of other sectors that need uh, housing for their employees. 
And if we think that industrial is some bellwether and it's gonna lead us into some great future, I just wanted to show you based on the National Association of Manufacturers, Idaho manufactured good exports in billions of dollars from 2000, 2019. That is not the chart you wanna see. Um, we are not uh, a growth area for manufactured goods. Uh, in fact, even though 83% of our manufactured goods are exported, we've seen almost a 40% decline in manufactured goods in, in Idaho uh, over the past um, uh, 10 years. So um, manufacturing is not where our growth is. Um, to show you even further, this is um, a bunch of data from um, BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and provided by Headwaters Economics. Um, from 1970 to 2000, Bonner County, this is Bonner County specific, we lost 373 manufacturing, including forest products related jobs, uh, but we grew a lot of other jobs. You see that chart on the right there. We grew a tremendous amount of service uh, and retail trade jobs. So this is really the strength of our economy and uh, you don't wanna kill the golden goose by um, you know, cutting off its oxygen supply or, or certainly cutting off its housing. Um, Dialing in a little closer, you know, since 2000, just in the last 20 years in Bonner County, we've added 344 manufacturing jobs. So 34 new per year in the whole county. Whereas we've added over 222 other jobs per year. And it's those other jobs that we really need to focus on. And you look at um, Idaho labor produced uh, North Idaho top jobs. These are the jobs that we can't fill, that our businesses are dying for. You know, police officers, uh, dental hygienists, nurse practitioners, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is the top 20 hot jobs in North Idaho for the next um, 10 years. And um, I didn't find any that were directly related to manufacturing. So um, I just want to paint a picture. I know this is kind of heady, um, but looking at, our industry and what drives North Idaho, you know, tourism is the third largest industry behind agriculture and technology. Um, no housing, no hospitality workers. And without that, we're, we're effectively killing the third largest industry in North Idaho. So this all ties into supporting those industries and supporting the housing that we need. Many, some of you remember, I know uh, Commissioner Huseman will remember, the comp plan was adopted in 2009. So there's plentiful industrial general land. In 2010 though, we did something pretty radical. The city chose to amend the commercial zoning to allow manufacturing in all the commercial zones. So there are some caveats. You have to have a retail component of it. I think the Lighthouse Blue Cheese Factory downtown is a, a great example where they, they employ uh, dozens and dozens of people making cheese curds but you can buy some there too. Um, with a conditional use permit, you can have manufacturing in any of the commercial zones up to 15,000 square feet, which is a fairly substantial size building, uh, about the size, a little bit larger than those lead lock buildings that I showed you. Getting to the end here, I wanna bring up a couple other points. This is the Thorn Research Facility over in Dover. I spoke with Tony Bellelli this morning. That building was up for sale for three years and it finally sold. Um, he said that literally dozens of potential buyers and employers walked away once they came to this community and tried to understand how they could possibly house anyone in this community and find workers uh, who could work in this community based on the housing crisis. It did just sell to a, a company that's almost fully robotic and automated. It will produce all their food goods there with just 25 employees. So maybe that's the solution, I don't know. Uh, in closing here, I did include this uh, really great um, study on the challenges of uh, excessive industrial zoning in American cities. You know, these properties typically have ideal geographic location. They're easily served, as we heard tonight, with infrastructure. They're close to services. They're close to jobs. Their lack of being put into productive use and just sitting fallow or growing hay means that they effectively drive higher taxes because other people have to support the services in the community because that land's not being taxed at its highest and best use. Um, and they certainly drive up um, housing costs in communities where there's excessive industrial zone land. Um, and they recommend that uh, changing the zoning should be considered where you have severe housing shortages. 
just to touch on a couple of final concerns and comments, closing comments. You know, there was a comment from the Independent Highway uh, District about traffic. I assume you didn't read the Whipple engineering study that showed that residential development on the site would uh, amount to 161 fewer trips in the AM peak hour than uh, industrial alternatives. Um, so traffic we don't feel is an issue. If it is an issue, we'll have to address that uh, if the land is ever subdivided or developed through a conditional use permit or a PUD. Um, you know, this, in considering the staleness of the comp plan, uh, this proposal is consistent with many of the residential uh, uses uh, outside of the airport, and it's not within the airport uh, uh, regulatory zone. Um, and this is the big chicken and egg conundrum, housing begets workers, which will allow our industry to grow. Um, some of you may be aware what happened down in Post Falls by the uh, Greyhound track. They had hundreds of acres of industrial zone land that they converted into residential. And sure enough, all of a sudden there's affordable housing and their industries take off. Um, I really wanna hit on this one. The development agreement uh, is unnecessary and um, it will be triggered at some point on future subdivision or site plan review. The reason I say it's unnecessary is for two reasons. One, it specifically talks about in code for uses that are inconsistent or not appropriate in the zone. Um, I think of this as if you're asking for commercial zoning and you didn't want a pawn shop or a liquor store or some other use, um, a development agreement in this case would um, be very disadvantageous to the applicant. Um, I can't say that strongly enough. Not only would it cause significant delays for it to go back and be crafted and then have to come back through you, um, it's just simply not necessary. We don't know what workforce housing is. We don't know what kind of density we're looking at yet on this property. Um, this is the preliminary first step in, in really trying to solve this problem of affordable housing uh, and, and bringing more housing inventory online in this community. Um, you know, this, this proposal is consistent with many portions of the comp plan, including housing affordability and infill development. The comp plan is incredibly stale. It needs to get updated to guide the present and future needs and vision of this community. Um, it it's, wouldn't be surprising to me if the city were undertaking a comp plan revision right now that significant areas of industrial zone land would be changed. Um, we do have significant inventory of under vacant or undeveloped industrial lands in the community. And uh, those can be utilized for years and years, as I've shown, based on the projected uh, manufacturing um, employment demand for the region. And then finally, uh, I, I say this very sincerely, um, I think uh, this community is at a greater risk of losing existing employers if house, the housing crisis can't be addressed than it is and is attracting new employers. So I really hope um, uh, you, you think hard on this. I want to emphasize the development agreement is not something we're interested in entertaining. Um, it's probably not needed based on the fact that we can do that at later stages in the development process. And, um, you know, we are in a housing crisis, and I think we all know that. With that, um, I'd certainly um, take any questions and really appreciate your time listening to all that tonight. I have a question. Are you representing the sellers or the buyers, the potential buyers of this I'm property? Representing the seller, the applicant. And let me just confirm: if we were to attach a development agreement or recommend that council do that, then uh, your client is not interested. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Questions for Jeremy? Okay, I think we should uh, move on to the public hearing. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there anyone who would like to testify in favor of this proposal to amend the comp, comp plan context area to CA3 and to rezone this from industrial to multifamily? I think we're gonna tackle both of these in one public hearing. Anybody remotely who wants to testify in favor? Melissa? Yes, Mr. Chairman, one moment. Thank you. Please turn on your microphone when you are prompted to speak. Ann Neal. Oh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Yes, okay. we can. Awesome. Thank you for hearing me. I, my name is Ann Neal. I live over here on South Levina Avenue. Um, and 
I want to thank you for your time. I want you to know that I generally approve this application and I applaud Lighthouse for seemingly taking a very proactive solution to sustainability for both, both them and their employees. Um, I, I have questions about the, I know I'm not supposed to ask questions, but I just think I have questions about the development agreement because I would be concerned if out of towners came and were allowed to somehow buy these properties without some kind of criteria in place to um, make sure that that doesn't happen, that those, those houses and that housing goes to local people who have demonstrated a commitment to Sandpoint, Idaho. Um, and so I, that would be a question that I would concern or something that I would really hope the council and the commissioners took into consideration and, and the property owners. And I just cite one, one town that I know has something like this in place, which is Friday Harbor, Washington, where they have implemented lots of housing options there, but you have to not, it does, it's not, it's not um, based on how much you earn as Mr. Grimm has pointed out in terms of like, getting a raise and then all of a sudden you don't qualify for the housing, but it's more a longevity kind of um, uh, commitment. How long have you lived in the community? How long have you been employed in the community? And then you become entitled to this kind of housing opportunity, which can then be sustainable for Lighthouse or whatever manufacturer or employer and the employee and their family as well. So that is one comment that I would make about that. But I want you to know that I think I applaud Lighthouse for taking this initiative and I would support them wholeheartedly having worked in service my entire life. And I understand what it is to pay rent and be priced out of being able to work where you, to, to live where you work. So thank you very much to all of you for your time tonight and I sign off. Thank you, Ms. Neal. Uh, do we have anybody else who would like to testify in favor? Mr. Moore, do you wish to testify in favor? Yes. Okay. Hi there, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow commissioners. Um, my name is Cliff Mort, and I reside uh, 1950 West Bella Reeve Lane in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, I'm not the applicant of this request uh, tonight, uh, although we are one of my companies is the contract purchaser of this subject to a rezone. And our, our goal is to create um, more affordable housing out here. I know that's a relative term. However, this is a request for a multifamily zone. And that that is the goal of this project. I. Uh, uh, also echo um, Mr. Grimm's uh, sentiment and the ap applicant's sentiment as it relates to a development agreement. I think uh, when when cities start going down a, uh, that road, I think it's a, a bit of a slippery slope when they start talking or, or trying to get involved in economics of housing. I think uh, the, the market itself, simple economics actually dictate supply and demand uh, and pricing based upon that. And I think the, the one thing that happens when you start putting those kind of requirements out there is it just takes a lot more time to put projects together. And right now in this current environment, um, it, timing is, is everything as it relates to helping with the current housing crisis. Um, you also have a requirement of a conditional use permit that would be uh, that that you would also get a shot at this project as it relates to what it looks like or in the event that we wanted to go down a path of various types of uses on this property other than just multifamily, we'd have to go through a planned unit development and again that would be brought to you and scrutinized very heavily so i think to add that one additional step really kind of defeats the purpose. And, and I just wanted to point that out. Uh, quick comment. It seems to me like the, the idea behind a development agreement might be to, we, we understand that for um, 
uh, units with eight, or sorry, development with eight units or more CUP would be required. And at that time, the commission and city council could impose conditions that might include, you know, percentages of the homes being price indexed to median incomes and so on. However, one thing we've seen recently, repeatedly in, in this commission is uh, subdivisions and developments in multifamily neighborhoods that don't require any CUPs because guess what? They're single family. Mm -hmm. So a rezone here of multifamily comes with no guarantee that a future development will even include multifamily. So that's something that we are very interested in protecting here. Uh, you, uh, a developer could come in without ever requesting a CUP and begin building single family homes in this. And now we've, we've rezoned ourselves into a corner without any ability to uh, fulfill the, the I, I don't know, the promise that we've made to uh, work towards increasing workforce housing. So I think it, knowing that a CUP is not something that will necessarily be required in the future on this property, a development agreement to, to us might appear to be the only way to assure that there would be uh, multifamily in this, in, this, uh, in this zone later on. <clears throat> um, with all due respect, I think the the requirement of any kind of development on this property would be either in the form of a of a preliminary plat or a PUD if if you were heading down the path anything other than than multifamily zone. That's my understanding of the code, and I, I may be incorrect, but I I think that you'd get a shot at at that either way. So you'd you'd be able to approve or deny based upon the information presented before you. I think all the the requirement of a of a development agreement up front in a in a initial rezone it just adds to the amount of time and it it takes a whole lot more to to get there that's all I'm suggesting I think you get the same thing out of either one of the other items gotcha. yeah understood so any other questions for Mr. Mort okay thank you thank you Mr. Mort is there anybody else who would like to testify in favor uh, Mr. Chairman, there is someone raising their hand online. Just a moment. Yeah. Teague Mullen. Hi, my name is Teague Mullen. I am uh, reside at uh, 4160 Sunnyside Road and just want to, you know, um, speak in favor of this development. I've been mm -hmm. in the real estate um, industry for 16 years here in Sandpoint. And, you know, obviously I, I represent Mort in a number of different constructions. Um, that he's done over time. But the, the biggest problem that we have right now is that the supply and demand and the timing in which it takes to develop, you know, you know, turnkey units for people to move into. And the only way that we're ever going to, you know, see a dip in this pricing that we have for new construction is that supply needs to be brought up and demand needs to be brought down. And, um, the, the timing is everything on, on something like this to where, you know, we have a number of different um, developments that are going on in the community with U of I and, and different projects. And, you know, we're, we're selling houses at a, a record price right now, where I, I feel that if supply, supply comes up and, you know, it'll bring demand down, it'll bring prices down to where people will eventually be able to afford to live here again, and especially in the workforce housing sector of it, um, you know, I'm ho I'm hopeful, but we don't know. Um, just being, a, you know, uh, a resort market, it's. Uh, but everything I'm saying is that you know we need to be pro growth and keeping the supply up. So I'm in favor of this project, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Teague. Anybody else, Melissa, in favor? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is there anyone who would like to testify who is neutral? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Luke Omad? Okay. Hello, my name is Luke Omad, 422 Lake Street, Sandpoint resident. Mr. Chairman and commissioners, I would urge your patience and I would strongly, strongly urge for a development agreement. I've heard eloquent words talking about timing and market conditions. I'm seeing what the market can bear as someone who has been here. 
and the market that is being born does not support the people that are here now. If that was the actual case, some of these developments would not be starting at four and $500,000. I was able to attend a very nice presentation by uh, the Whiskey Rock Development, and we couldn't afford to do a sidewalk. So I would urge, please, to consider a development agreement. I like Lighthouse. I worked there after high school. Lighthouse has held that property for a long time. I think that they've been an important part of this community and that patience can be demonstrated by making a very thoughtful plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Anybody else who would like to testify who is neutral? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is there anyone who would like to testify who is opposed? Mr. Chairman? Yes. We have Angelo Lanzacero. Okay. Hi. My name is Angelo Lanzacero. I'm a Sagal resident. Um, <clears throat> what we've seen here tonight is a comprehensive plan change that's going to take a large percentage of future commercial property off the books. Then you're going to have blowback from other people that have commercial property already. And they're going to want to change their zoning to multifamily. Everybody can get on the Aspenization of Sandpoint and Bonner County. This is what's going on. It doesn't matter how much housing you put on the market, the price is not going to come down. There's, there's too many people out there that want into the neighborhood. I think it's asinine to think that you're just going to put more housing in place and the prices are going to come down. That's not going to happen. You would have to build on every available piece of land in the whole county. That's not going to happen. So it's disingenuous to say that uh, we need workforce housing for people who are, who are not making enough money to live here. Well, they're, they're, being, they're being taxed out of here to begin with, even if they don't own a piece of property. We have the, the local option tax that Sandpoint wants to pass more onerous taxes on the lowest income people. Our governor and the legislature won't let go of the grocery tax. Then who does that hit? The low income people. So it's really disingenuous to talk about, we wanna help these lower income people. You're not helping them. All you're doing is putting more housing out there that's gonna be used for people to come in, pay the exorbitant prices, and drive the, the people out. I think in my mind, you wanna keep that commercial component so that uh, new manufacturing can come in and have jobs for, for local people. Because the new jobs are not gonna be somebody going to college, getting a degree, and thinking that they're gonna support themselves locally. That's not gonna happen. The jobs that are gonna to come to the fore next are gonna be small manufacturing jobs. That's what's, going to, that's what's going to get by. People are going to be going to trade schools, learning a trade, and earning enough money to support themselves. So that's my point on the whole thing. Thank you. And the lack of a development agreement just stinks to high heaven. Okay. And so, so who exactly owns the property right now? I, I, we haven't heard that. Is it Lighthouse? Or is Lighthouse purchasing it from somebody? Yeah, Lighthouse is the current owner. They are the current yeah. owner. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other people in attendance or on Zoom who would like to speak or testify who are opposed? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor, neutral, or opposed before we close the public hearing? Do the commissioners have any questions at this time? Oh, Jeremy, come on, come on up. We have Jeremy. Uh, you have the, op the opportunity for a rebuttal testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners. Appreciate your time again. A um, couple of things I just want to touch on here. Um, you know, uh, first and foremost, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm I'm not talking about. Um, 
and this applicant isn't talking about, you know, an identified project at a price price range that we know at this point how it's going to be developed. What we're talking about is is a an overwhelming crush and desperation of our schools, our hospitals, our municipal government. How long have you you've been trying to hire planners? How long is it going to take to fill this man's seat next week? We don't have housing in this community. We don't know what the housing is going to be on this site yet. This is the first of several steps. No sane person is going to invest in a design plan and tie their hands to unknown development agreements when you're trying to figure out AMI, area median income, and what percentage of units have to qualify. And, you know, you know is it going to work? Let me just tell you, weeks going through City Hall, working on development agreements equal months delays in a project. Months waiting for hearings equal half years and years of delay. Look at the U of I. We have been going on the U of I for over a year and a half. We have one, one house built there. Come on. Please don't hand tie this project so early by saying you have some omnipotent view of what the housing has to be on it. Let the free market work. Supply and demand, we've got a potential buyer who builds market rate houses all over the country. He's an expert at it. And I, I just want to emphasize that the Aspenization of Sandpoint will happen when Lighthouse can't hire the next lineman, when Cochava can't hire the next programmer, when Leadlock can't hire the next employee, when the hospital can't hire the next employee, when another restaurant shuts down or closes on another night because someone has a perfect ideal of what they need the housing to look like. We just need supply. It's basic economics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. At this time, the commission will deliberate. No new information may be provided and questions may be directed only to city staff during deliberation. The staff report includes suggested motions. You may find them there. So let's let's deliberate. We uh, I should note that Commissioner Dunkel had to leave at six thirty, so we're down to four, which is plenty. <laughs> <clears throat> Would anybody like to start? John, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do. I have several. Um, one, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of of uh, positive things said about. The, the free market pricing, but free market pricing is why we're in this crisis because there hasn't been any kind of restrictions. We've seen a whole lot of property that could have been multifamily and it ends up coming in a single family and that raises the price for everybody. So there needs, and I don't know what the best form is, but between city staff and council, perhaps there is some way that we can, I think we need to have a guarantee that it comes in as a multifamily project because we don't uh, in its current form. So that would be one of my, my questions, um, part of that deliberation. Uh, another thing would be the whole, well, a couple of things. One is the whole precedent. Are we, I know we've, excuse me, we've had that come up before where if we do this, what is the precedent gonna be for the next people? Would they have legal right to say, well, you're taking it right from me because you gave it to them. And that's essentially the same sort of, of property. So I would have a, a question on that. And, and the, the, the other thing that has not come up here at all tonight is the impact of this on the operation of the airport. Um, even though it is outside of that lateral safety zone, if there is several hundred people living that close, uh, there will be uh, concerns even, and they, they shouldn't because they knew it when they bought into it. Um, but on the other hand, that, that's just not the way human nature is. They will start complaining about noise and, and uh, it could have an impact on the airport, which is a huge economic driver uh, for this community. So those, those are some of my thoughts and some of my questions. Thanks, John. Forrest? No comment. No comment. But you said it. Yeah. You generally agree with John. I generally agree with Johnny. At this point in time, I think it's maybe everybody's in a big hurry. Um, buzzwords are always affordable housing, workforce housing. Um, 
a lot of rubber stamping going on with those words around it. Um, there's about, you say 600 units, that's probably about almost 900 doors coming online in the next uh, two to three years. It would be good to see how that plays out without um, breaking down some of the larger industrial pieces that are getting some interest from developers um, and <clears throat> regional interest in larger commercial developments. I don't think we should be too quick to give that up in favor of uh, an ephemeral idea of what workforce housing might be. I haven't heard anybody talking about subsidies for types of housing, multi-unit residential, what it's gonna look like. I think without a development agreement of some sort or some sort of restriction, we're, we're just giving away the farm. I, I knew you had something to say for us, thank you. I do go on. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I've gone back and forth and back and forth on this one. When I first read it, I thought, yeah, this is great. We'll develop a lot more housing. And then when I read more about it, I was more concerned about our available industrial land. Uh, I thought actually that Jeremy's argument about that was fairly compelling, that we do have a good deal of industrial land uh, still available. Um, I don't know about sizes, uh, whether the parcels we have are big enough. Uh, that I, I thought was a compelling argument. Um, I just have, I'm really, really frustrated that the comp plan has just been hanging in limbo for two years. If we had worked on the comp plan or kept working on it, this problem would be solved. We would know what our values are and what we want to do with this land. But we just haven't done that. So we're in this pickle and we do need the housing, but I, uh, I kind of agree with Forrest that I, well, I guess, and John too, I just cannot see changing this without a development agreement. The market hasn't worked for us. Like John said, the market is the reason we're here. So I cannot see giving up this land for a developer who's at Excel, excels at market rate housing. It's given our market, that's not what we need. So I, I think I could be talked into the rezone, um, but not without the development agreement. Oh, and I have one question, maybe Darren, is there any possibility of giving the rezone or the context area change to part of this parcel, but not all of it? Or is that just a whole nother application in another hearing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, the application in front of you is for the balance of the 25 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's the application that you need to act upon. Um, I suppose if in making your recommendation, you could um, recommend that the counselor that the applicant consider something less. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you do need to act on the application in front of you in, um, in its form. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, I just, I'd actually like to commend Darren and the, the really detailed staff report that he produced here. It was, yeah. it was super informative. And uh, Jeremy also pre pre presented a nice um, report for us from the applicant's perspective. Um, look, I, we, there, we talk about buzzwords, workforce housing, affordable housing, um, market priced housing. And another buzzword that we hear from the mayor and from the Sandpoint Workforce Housing Task Force, which I believe Mr. Mort is a member of, is public-private partnerships. So when I think of a development agreement, I don't think of us, you know, taking away the rights of the developer to charge whatever price they want for these homes. It's more partnering with the developer to assure that some proportion of the homes that ultimately end up in this development are without question available to workers in the local economy. So it's, it's really not um, all or nothing, I don't think. We're not saying that there needs to be rent controls or government subsidized housing here and that we expect um, you know, uh, Mr. Mort or any other developer to come in and do our, our, our demands, to fulfill those demands from the city. It's, it's about working out an agreement that is beneficial to the private sector and satisfies the, the motives of, of private developers, but also meets some of the urgent needs in our community. So we, we hear you know, from 
the mayor and uh, the, the outcomes of these workforce task force, workforce housing task force meetings of which you're part. And it would be great to have you as a partner in, in that, f the fulfilling of those visions and pub public private partnerships. It seems like this is a great opportunity to demonstrate, uh, you know, the private sector's willingness to work with, with the government to meet some of the essential needs. And uh, as far as the context area amendment goes, um, I think members of this commission are generally in favor of that. We read the letters from the CEOs of um, the largest employers, three of the largest employers in Sandpoint wrote letters in support of this. Um, I think to, uh, you know, show that we re respect their visions and their needs for workforce housing, we need to secure some guarantee that there will be actual workforce housing. We do know what workforce housing is. Um, it, it is for workers in the local economy. And there are models all over the country for how that can that can occur. And it doesn't mean that there won't be market priced housing in future development here. It just means that we're um, taking one small step to assure some housing for people who work in the local economy who earn, you know, closer to or below the area median income. So I'm also in favor of a development agreement. And I think that's probably the direction we're going here. Um, I, I don't think that should scare away, you know, the buyer from this from this deal, because it doesn't mean we're taking away all the rights to build housing that can be sold at market prices as well. So that's, um, and of course the sense of urgency, yes, we got to grow supply uh, faster than we can grow demand. I think demand has been growing at an unprecedented rate for the last year and a half. Um, I think the urgency might be on the supplier's part to, to capitalize on the record demand of the last year and a half as quickly as possible. So I'd say let's, let's again, slow down a little bit um, and make sure we do it right so that this, 25 acres, which as far as I can tell is one of the last largest undeveloped par parcels in all of Sandpoint, um, does provide housing that meets the needs of our community, um, not just the urgency from the developer to cash in while the market's hot, or uh, the demand from the potential buyers who, as far as I can tell, the developments we've seen in the last year are mostly going to uh, people who don't work in the local economy, um, who are second homeowners, investors, speculators, uh, remote workers, and that's not what we need more of right now. Of course, that is somebody's workforce, but we know who our workforce is. It's the people who work for Lighthouse, Bonner General, the, the school district. Um, that's who we hear from uh, supporting this rezone. And that's who we should uh, take these, this step to, to serve tonight. Thank you. So are you suggesting, well, never mind. That's, you can. Is there any other thoughts or deliberations from the commission or questions for staff before we entertain a motion? I, I think I, would, I have one question for council and that is what are our options yeah, for guaranteeing that, that multifamily will be on this site? Darren, I think it would be a good idea if you can put the option slide back up for them. Um, stand by. And you have some proposed motions in front of you. If but that's any... not that's not quite what my question is. Right. <laughs> but what I was going to say is you could amend the motion to approve to add an additional recommendation, recommended requirement that the rezone be accompanied by a development agreement that at the very least includes the requirement of multifamily housing. So then you're not in the weeds of trying to decide what the terms and conditions of a Correct. development agreement right now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You are simply making a recommendation to council that you would recommend approval of the rezone as long as there is an accompanying development agreement that at the very least includes a requirement for multifamily housing. I don't think for me that would be quite sufficient. Um, because I think mark multifamily housing at market rate may not serve our pro uh, solve our housing problem. Sandpoint City Code nine dash nine dash eleven, which is where these options are coming from, and that was outlined in detail in the staff report, also identifies an option that you can make a motion that 
a development agreement be prepared within a certain amount of time. It would stay all time frames under Sandpoint City Code, and you would retain jurisdiction until you had a development agreement in front of you that you were comfortable with. I think, however, I heard Mr. Grimm say the application's at risk if we go down the road of, of the length of time that that might take. But the, that's all before you as, as options. Uh, Fonda, who, who actually writes the development agreement? How, how do we make sure, I mean, to expedite this, you know, I'd love to see this in two weeks with the development agreement drafted. Obviously that's pretty ambitious, but um, how do we assure that when we eventually do see this again with a draft development agreement, it's, it's one that, I mean, who, who, who writes that? You so at this stage, you would simply make a motion to, to stay these proceedings, that you would retain jurisdiction of the development agreement. We could have some conversation between staff then and the applicant regarding some requested terms for that development agreement. Um, essentially, it would be a collaborative effort, and then it would come back to you. Okay. Before it goes to city council. Okay. The other option is it goes to city council with the recommendation, but the council is going to send it back to you for approval anyways. Okay. Or a recommendation of approval or so Is there any reason that the drafting of development agreement should delay this by six months or a year? It could. It could. Mm -hmm. Because? Because it could just take time to come to terms that everybody agrees on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Depends on how detailed you intend it to be. If the goal here is to maintain multifamily housing, and, and I understand you may have some more parameters that you'd like to put on that. I mean, that's, that's essentially what you're talking about. You would want to put some, as Darren indicated earlier, some overarching parameters on this without trying to get into the weeds of a full-blown development agreement right now. That's going to be difficult. There sure. isn't a project. Sure. Can't do that tonight. Okay, would anybody like to make a motion? One more comment. Sure. I can't help but think that um, an approval here would probably open the door to everybody else that's got a piece of industrial general zoning out there to come before us with an application for development of one sort or another or a zone change down the road probably within the next six months. All along Great Northern where all those little parcels are, every one of those, that road is at full capacity right now. That road is set to undergo a $33 million <laughs> update starting 2023 that will be done by 2027 as well. So we should point that out. Too soon. Right. right. Um, just to clarify though, uh, any um, future applications like this would not be able to apply directly for a rezone. It would also have to amend the comprehensive plan. So we're also amending the comp plan context areas tonight. And I think given that it's been 12 years since the comp plan was adopted, it's, it's high time we, we take that step and we have this conversation because I suspect that if we had amended it two years ago when it was set to be updated, there would have been more multifamily zoning included yeah. and more, more multifamily context areas included in the update two but years ago. Not. Yeah. And we can, yeah, I, I understand Forrest what you're saying. So with that, would anybody like to make a motion? So Darren, do you want to remind them of the two separate decisions that need to be made and in which order? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, please consider the, um, the comprehensive plan amendment and depending on the, um, the direction that the uh, commission goes on that, then you would make a second part motion um, on the rezone request. Would there I, be any? I, I don't have a clue how to word this. I don't understand. I, I would like to I, go back a slide and do the retained jurisdiction thing, but uh, this is so different from what I've done before that I just don't know how to. The uh, comprehensive plan amendment doesn't have a retained jurisdiction or a development agreement option. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so that is in your packet Justice. on page five. Okay. And it's also on this piece of paper here. Yes. Okay. Paper. Yes. So in front of you. I can move to approve 
the request for the comp plan change. You would be making a motion to recommend that city council approve. Okay. Could we conceivably then end up with an, a comp plan, a context area change and not a zoning change because we want to retain jurisdiction on the zoning change? You would be making recommendations to council. Right, okay. But we could recommend that. But in so doing, we would change this, the context area on this entire parcel from uh, industrial to, well, no, sorry. Industrial to CA3. Industrial to, uh, yeah. well, we'd be recommending the city council do that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then once that door is open, maybe, I don't know how, whether it's harder to close the other ones. Um, I mean, at this point, quite honestly, for me, the uh, option that I would be most comfortable with is the third option, which is postponement, so we can gather more information. And so that we can see what some of these options are that have been discussed. Some of that has just come up to light this evening. Um, and one more time to consult <coughs> with staff. And Yeah, we just do that a lot. It's well, I think there's been, down. you know, more options have come forward, more of, of the desires of the community have been brought forward. Um, that, that is an option before us as well, is to postpone. If we think more information will help us in our decision. Mr. Chairman and Commissioner, if, if the commission decides to go in that direction, please be very specific uh, for us on what additional information we'll be seeking and what we'll be doing. I understand that. You're, you're what? sounding like you're in a cave. Something got garbled there. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was simply saying um, if the commission does, does um, does vote to postpone please be very specific in your findings as to what additional information you'd be looking for so that we can come prepared um, at the next hearing i I'd, I'd rather entertain a motion to uh, to approve with a development agreement attached to the second um item if anybody's ready to make that motion you have to do motion the first. Approval. Yeah, no, I'm, I I mean, subsequent to the motion to approve the context area change. Darren, do you mind going back to the language uh, on the previous slide, the findings in order to approve? There we go. That, that, that should help anybody who wants to make this motion. I could make it myself if nobody else would like to. Am I allowed to make a motion myself, Fonda? I think so. I think okay. So. All right, I, I, I'm going to uh, move the Sandpoint Planning, Planning and Zoning Commission after consideration of the criteria and relevant standards of Idaho Code and Sandpoint City Code recommend that the Sandpoint City Council approve the request by Lighthouse Inc. for a comprehensive plan map amendment to redesignate the property known as parcel number RPS 00000103605A located in section 10 Township 57 North Range 2 West from Industrial Zoning to Context Area 3. The reasons Behind this decision are, uh, there is a need for additional housing at the proposed location that overrides the long range need for industrial land. The proposed context area three land use designation is consistent and compatible with existing and future land uses in the vicinity of the site. Housing on the site in question will be compatible with both the operation of the airport and the existing and future industrial lands to the south and east of the site. Staff has followed the notice procedures applicable to zone changes contained in Idaho code Section 67-6511 and Sandpoint City Code Title IX, Chapter 9. Do we do we um, do both at once, Fonda, or should we no, you should vote on that right. one first? Okay. Would anybody like to second that? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, roll call. Clerk. Commissioner Huseman? Aye. Commissioner Shuck? Nay. Commissioner Hastings? Aye. Commissioner Walker? Aye. Okay. Um, and with that motion passing, I then move 
the Sandpoint Planning and Zoning Commission, after consideration of the criteria and relevant standards of Idaho Code and Sandpoint City Code, recommend that the Sandpoint City Council approve the request by Lighthouse Incorporated for a zone change on the property known as parcel RPS 00000103605A, located in Section 10, Township 57 North, Range 2 West, from Industrial General Zoning to Residential Only Multifamily. But I would like, I don't have to amend my motion. Um, uh, and I would like that uh, motion to uh, include a development agreement that at the very least requires the inclusion of multifamily housing and uh, some language about the requirement that workforce housing be included in this development to some extent to be determined in the uh, language of that agreement, in the development of the language of that agreement. The reasons for this decision are the proposed zone change is in conformance with the future land use map and other policies within the comprehensive plan. The proposed multi residential multifamily zone is consistent and compatible with existing zoning and future land uses in the vicinity of the site. The land use allows land uses allowed within the residential multifamily zone, including housing of all types, will be compatible with both the operation of the airport and the existing and future industrial lands to the south and east of the site. Particular consideration has been given to the effects of this proposed zone change upon the delivery of services by any political subdivision providing public services within the planning jurisdiction and staff has followed the notice procedures applicable to zone changes contained in Idaho Code Section 67-6511 and Sandpoint City Code Title IX, Chapter 9. Can you give the wording of your... So the motion is to approve the uh, zone change from industrial to residential multifamily. Um, and to include a development agreement that at the very least requires the inclusion of multifamily housing and some uh, workforce housing. You recommend to council. That I would right? recommend, of course, this is all a recommendation to council. Correct. I'll second. Uh, roll call vote, Melissa. Commissioner Walker. Aye. Commissioner Hastings. Aye. Commissioner Shook. Nay. Commissioner Huseman. Aye. Okay, that motion passes. And with no further business before the commission, this meeting is now adjourned at 7.16 p.m.